United. Hello, nerds. Welcome to the History of Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Today, Dr. James Kirby Martin. Jim's already been on the podcast, wanted to bring him back. Today, talking about something completely different. It's a documentary on Benedict Arnold called Benedict Arnold Hero Betrayed. It is based on Jim's book, Benedict Arnold Revolutionary Hero, that he wrote a little while back. Jim was part of the process of putting the documentary together. I've seen it. You can go find it on Amazon right now. It's really good. You hear a lot about Benedict Arnold, and we ended up talking about Benedict for a long time, just kind of going through his entire life and what you see within the documentary that a lot of people don't realize about Benedict Arnold. He tells you the story really interesting. He dives into everything, and we go back and forth on some stuff. It was a really interesting conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Let me shut up, and let's get to it. Dr. James Kirby Martin. All right. Welcome to the podcast, James Kirby Martin. Excuse me, Dr. James Kirby Martin. Don't want to leave that part off. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. It's it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And um, I'm looking forward to our conversation. I think we're going to have pretty uh, interesting chit-chat here. I mean, absolutely. I think you have a very interesting point of view on Benedict Arnold, the archetype of traitor to any American citizen, um, either then or now. So you wrote a book, uh, Revolutionary Hero, an American Warrior Reconsidered in 1997. And then a documentary, Benedict Arnold Hero Betrayed, just came out in 2021. That's a lot of time in between. We're, we're used to, oh, this book's a bestseller. There's going to be a movie tomorrow. That, that's a long road. How'd that come about? I'll go all the way back to 2001, as a matter of fact. And we discussed the possibility of doing some sort of a documentary. And I said, go for it if you want to. I'll be glad to uh, support your activity. I'll be glad to participate and see what we come up with. The idea of doing a program on Benedict Arnold, America's most notorious trader, it's not surprising. It wasn't an easy sell. You need money to make a film. And if you go out and you say to someone, would you like to invest, oh, $50,000, $100,000 in a film about Benedict Arnold? They say, well, if you talk to me about George Washington or another one of the really uh, important revolutionary leaders, well, that would be one thing, but I don't want my name associated with Benedict Arnold. So one of the challenges of this project over the years was a very simple and basic one, and that was coming up with enough money to keep it going. Slowly but surely, and slowly is the right word, but surely the film did come together. And from my point of view, has come out and turned out to be a very worthwhile project uh, that I think people are going to find surprising. And I also think they're going to find it entertaining. I think they're going to learn a lot about the American Revolution that maybe they didn't know. They'll learn a lot about one of the principal characters of the American Revolution. After all, 20, 30 years ago, when I first started showing interest in Arnold, perhaps doing a book on him. Um, it's fair to say that Arnold's name was more or less universal, well-known. Let me give you this example. When I was a kid growing up back in grade school, the first time I had any contact with American history was in fourth grade. And I was taught that there was the hero of the revolution, and I think very well of him, I think it's an incredible person. That is George Washington. George Washington was, was treated, well, in my case, was told he was really a person of great virtue, uh, was willing to sacrifice for the greater whole of the good community, uh, willing to give his all to win this very important revolution against British tyranny. But then I was also taught right next to that there was this bad guy. In other words, there's this poll and there's the opposite poll. And the bad guy was this guy, Benedict Arnold. And he, of all things, turned against the cause and didn't see how virtuous this cause was. And so that's what I was taught, not questioning it. And I more or less accepted it. And time passed over time. And uh, ultimately, what became clear to me, let's say now we're going to jump ahead several years, was that Arnold was well worth a study on his own, and that a lot of what had been taught about him was suspicious. For instance, whereas Washington was so virtuous, he did cut down the cherry tree, went told that, I can't tell a lie. And that Arnold never could tell the truth about anything, and that he was a little hellion, causing all sorts of problems in the community that he grew up in, which was Norwich, Connecticut, and Eastern Connecticut. He did all these devilish little things. In fact, you can associate them with the devil, like he liked to 
They're in thunderstorms. He'd jump up on the table and he'd yell and scream. That was all because he was being influenced by the devil. He would do things like he'd spread broken glass all over the little trails the kids would be taking to school. And I always wondered when I started to think about it, didn't the kids ever wear shoes? Were they getting their feet cut up because of that? He loved to climb up into trees and he loved to squeeze the life out of baby birds. That's another story that's been told about him. You can read this in various biographies and I can go on and on and on about what I call the Arnold Tales. When in truth, what I learned when I got into this subject, these stories are fundamentally fables. They've been made up. And that what I found when I started doing research was that Arnold rarely commented on his youth, but when he did, he told one leading revolutionary, Benjamin Rush of Pennsylvania, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, he said, I was a young lad, and then the point came in my life when I just had to grow up, and I would describe my life before I decided I had to grow up, that I was basically a coward. That He wasn't this little hellion running all over the place. He wasn't this disaster in, in the making. He was sort of warmed up, if I could put it that way, uh, with these childhood annex. And then his great cause became to destroy the American Revolution. But fortunately, he was found out, he was discovered, he was cast aside. Well, what's interesting about that is why all the fuss? What did this guy do that made him into the anti-hero of the revolution? Well, we know that in September of 1780, he was the commander uh, and that he tried to sell out West Point, or at least that's how the story goes. And he was basically caught in the act, although they didn't catch him. He got away. He got to the British New York City, which was their main base of operations, and he got away. But the near attempt to try to despoil the revolution, despoil everything, by losing West Point, that indeed, in the end, was what he was trying to do. And that is wipe out this above virtuous cause that we know as the American Revolution. If you rewind back to, there's so much that happens, especially the documentary and especially your book go into it. When you're going back to the childhood that he kind of glosses over himself, right? He grows up in Connecticut. The Arnold family at that point is a pretty well-known name. They're not necessarily rich like Washington rich or anything like that. But he, I believe, had a governor in his family tree of Connecticut, correct? Uh, of Rhode Island, as a matter of fact. The family settled in Rhode Island. And the first Benedict in North America, Benedict I, we can call him, replaced Roger Williams, a famous colonial figure, uh, as the governor of uh, Rhode Island. And the family was so prominent in Rhode Island that if you go to today to Newport, you can actually visit the, the Arnold family graveyard. That's a story in itself, but I don't want to I don't want to get the bird on it, but it's still there today. So the family then, generation passes, generation passes, and one of the issues is, is the generations passes, they keep dividing up their land and they get into farming units that are so small they really can't, are not viable economically. So Arnold's father, that I call Benedict Fool, he actually becomes a barrel maker and he will then migrate to Connecticut and good fortune will allow him to marry into a family in the Norwich, Connecticut community. And he will then set himself up as a trading merchant. Now that's around the time that uh, our Benedict V is born, 1741. And the family is prospering during the 1740s, but there are certain things that go on and there are many stories to tell, but I'll just, I'll just do one. And that is the Arnolds are prospering. They have a very nice home. Business is good. Arnold is sent off to a school. Sort of the idea is to get him well educated uh, so that he would get on track to maybe attend Yale College, become a lawyer, a, a person of great standing in the community because so few people went to college at the time. But then the family tragedy that occurred in the late uh, 1740s and into the early 1750s, well, like Today, we have what? COVID. We have the COVID pandemic all over the place. Well, they'd have different kinds of pandemics at the time. And one of them was a diphtheria pandemic that struck New England. And if you get diphtheria, it's hard to survive because ultimately your throat's going to get closed off on you. You can't breathe and you will slowly suffocate. Well, at this time, there were, besides Benedict, four other children. And three of those four children will die. And this is shattering to this family. It's shattering to the father. In fact, there's one description that he almost died too. And it's like at that point that that family comes apart. No more is it a family with five children. They're down to two, Arnold, his younger sister, Hannah, mom and dad. I believe this is when dad 
started to have his problem. And his problem was his, his family had been destroyed. Everything he loved in that family had been destroyed while he took to drink. And as he developed an alcohol problem, his business success started to go away. He couldn't really manage well. And everything begins to go downhill for the family, literally to the point that there's almost nothing there by the time that the father will pass away much later, around uh, 1760. Mom also passes away. And it's during this period, Arnold's pulled back from the schools. He's pulled back from the fast track. And through his mother, a woman named Hannah, uh, she has cousins. We'll call them the Lathrop brothers. And they are in the apothecary and merchant business, uh, selling various kinds of goods, uh, maybe general store owners, we would call them today, something like that. And Arnold will be an apprentice to them. And that's where he's going to learn the business trade that will carry him forward in life. But that crisis right there is full of meaning because when the family begins to come apart, he's away at school. Mom begins and they have survived. These letters have survived that she wrote him. And these letters have a very heavy kind of, I would call, Calvinist theme. And it's very much, be prepared, your sister is on the edge. Uh, someone has passed away. Your father's in very bad shape. You must be prepared because God could strike you dead any time. And that's, that's called arbitrary power. And he's being taught that by his mother, that God could take him just because he wanted to take people, because they may have sinned in some way that's inexplicable. And he actually will rebel against that kind of thinking. Well, and also right around this time is is the Great Awakening. Right. It's probably the worst time for everything that you're talking about, right? Because Arnold's father, when he's drunk, he's not drinking at home. But he's drinking out publicly. He's, you know, for lack of a better term, making an ass of himself out in public. That's right. Can you tell me, I know there's thousands of books on it, but real quickly, what's the Great Awakening for somebody who doesn't know what it is? The Great Awakening is a time of religious revival. And it, it strikes in Virginia, it strikes very heavily in New England and other various colonies. And really, this is an attempt to get back to basic scripture. And there are these traveling itinerant kind of ministers, and they'll come into communities, and they'll preach a vital faith that you must get your life centered on God, not on yourself. That is centered on God through your Savior, Jesus Christ. That's really the fundamental teaching that's there. And some of that teaching is quite extreme because the kind that struck in Norwich, where the Arnold family is, really has that harsh Calvinist side where God is an arbitrary power, that God can just strike you dead because you haven't been good, or someone hasn't, I've got to punish you people to keep you on the track. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You can think of that, that kind of terminology. And Arnold's parents are very much into that. And then they're passing it to the son. And he's saying, wait a minute, my father almost died. He's turned into an alcoholic. I've lost my sisters. I've lost a brother, two sisters, a brother. And I could lose my mother. I could lose everybody. What's this all about? And that's part of his whole education. It isn't that this is all written down, but you, what you do when you're writing biography, you put the person in the context of their times, not in the context of our times, which we get too much of these days. We put them in the context, and this is one of the contexts that I thought was so important about understanding Arnold, because maybe in his mind, God was an arbitrary power in the 1740s as he's learning that, not that he necessarily believed it, but he's acting on it. And then all you have to do is add, start to add this sense that's growing in the 1760s and the 1770s, and that is that the British are what? That they're tyrannical, that they're passing all these lie, uh, acts, tax acts, stamp act, the Towns and Duties Act, ultimately the Tea Act. Over and over again, they're striking us. They're ruining our economy. They're making it difficult for Arnold to do business. And the British start to become to him and to many other people, what? An arbitrary power. And there you go. It's a transition that's made. And then there's going to be another transition, although we're, I'm jumping ahead now. I'll just mention this briefly in this context. And that is ultimately for Arnold, the other arbitrary power would be the Continental Congress and various revolutionary leaders. He doesn't believe they view the revolution with the heart and the care and the blood and guts that he has given to the cause. And it makes him begin to doubt the cause and see it too as potentially an arbitrary power. 
One of the things that aligns to kind of the thought of arbitrary power that goes back to, you know, his early childhood and really throughout his life is the way he feels society has wronged him as a whole, right? Because in these days during the Great Awakening, if your father's a drunk, it means you're bad too, right? It means the children are bad. The wife is bad. Absolutely. Obviously, the, the devil has gotten into the family and everyone is bad. That's right. right? And it seems to almost follow him throughout his life that there's this mental scar for Arnold that makes him kind of see enemies everywhere. You know, I'm trying to think of just trying to count up how many duels he tried to get into throughout his life. It's it's mind boggling how often he would just throw that out there and people would just kind of wave him away and say, you know, we don't need to worry about it. But it does seem that it sets up Arnold to be very difficult to deal with as a personality. Right. He doesn't have a lot of friends from this time period. There aren't like a lot of people that seem to kind of stay in his life. Do you think that that's as big a piece as everything else, like the Great Awakening, but also seeing how society just decided that entire family was bad and that he really couldn't trust community? Well, there's no doubt that when the father becomes the town alcoholic, whatever you want me to say, drunk or whatever it is, that there is an attempt on the part of the good people of Norwich who are good and faithful Christians to excommunicate him from the church. And the local pastor actually will protect the father in his latter days because he's destroying the South. He really dies of acute alcoholism from everything that we can tell that is the father, obviously. And there is this sort of chip on the shoulder. Well, your father was an alcoholic. You'll probably end up being an alcoholic. And then there's a lot of prejudging or kind of spiteful. And one of the things that's really interesting, Arnold will accept this. And through the Lathrops, he's going to move away and they're going to help set him up a business in New Haven. And uh, Arnold will become a very successful businessman very quickly. He'll go back in 1763 and rebuy the family homestead, the family property in Norwich. He will then tell his sister, Hannah, move to New Haven, live with me. And he turns around and sells the property. And it's sort of like, I hate to use this kind of expression, but think of a certain finger on your hand that he just gave to that community. I am not what you think I am. I am not an alcoholic. I'm a successful businessman, and I don't even want to be a part of your community, so I'm selling this even though I was good enough to buy the homestead that my father lost because of his alcoholism. It's amazing that a person would do that. So there is this chip on the shoulder. And Arnold's very char characteristic of a lot of gentlemen during the era. That is, don't mess with me. If you insult my family name, and Arnold has every reason to be really sensitive about this, him and his father, and what he's been through in that community. <laughs> if you mess with my name, hey, if you want, we can just step outside and have a little duel. Now, there really weren't that many duels, but Arnold more than once did threaten people and say, well, if you really feel that way, let's get a brace of pistols and go out there and get it settled one way or the other. I know he was involved in at least one, probably two duels. And another thing that you just touched on, too, which I think history books kind of talk about him having money, but also being obsessed with money. But I think what's often lost is, like what you said, the Arnolds were very prosperous. Then everything happens with the father, diphtheria and all those things, and they drop. They become on the poor side of things, but Arnold is an extremely hard worker. He's very intelligent. He makes those fortunes return. However, the fortune that he had being, you know, mercantile and, and druggists and things like that, he wasn't like a George Washington rich. George Washington was never going to be poor unless the British took it from him. Whereas with Arnold, his type of work could very easily go the other way. He has a one or bad two years. He can go back to being poor. Do you think that that also kind of builds into his character, that feeling of impermanence when it comes to security? Perhaps um, one of the comparisons with Washington is George, when he did get married, selected well. He married one of the wealthiest women in America. George was in good shape to start with, but the amount of property that George and Martha have is massive by the standards of the era. He may have been one of the two or three richest people uh, in the colonies. Arnold it was a different kind of a track. He was he was a merchant. You have your ups and you have your downs. There was one point in the mid 1760s when the local economies are, are really not in good shape. And he has some very, very difficult times. And he, he knows how to recover. He, he builds his business. He doesn't marry into a super wealthy family. He married into the Mansfield family. He goes in, and this is his wife, his first wife is Margaret or Peggy Mansfield. And uh, Arnold goes into business with um, 
Peggy's father, they, they develop a small fleet of trading vessels. And it's not all apothecaries with him. He's literally out on the high sea as a ship's captain, as a merchant ship's captain. He's trading down into the West Indies. Some of those letters have survived. Uh, he's trading up into Canada. That's one reason he has familiarity with Canada, uh, with Quebec, and all the way down to uh, Montreal. As one person wrote, in 1774, he's the most creditworthy merchant in New Haven. Everything is going well, except there is this little problem with the British, which will come to consume his life. So the business records are available. He's a fair-minded trader, but don't mess with him and don't try to cheat him. Or you may find yourself having a discussion over a brace of pistols, something like that. He's a hard-nosed, driven, and amazingly enough, key point here, 1775 giving person. He gets involved in the war as fast as anyone does in 1775. And for three years, he gives it his all. That's the part they didn't teach me in school. Yeah, I mean, he didn't tiptoe into the revolution. Like, he was Samuel Adams crazy about getting into the revolution and really giving it to the British. Absolutely. There's this well-known Boston massacre in 1770 where British troops fire into a crowd. It's really, you know, when you call it a massacre, there were five people of them that died and a few others that were wounded. It's not what we think of as a massacre, but it was at the time. That's how it was labeled. Arnold is out in the high seas and he finds out about this in one of the West Indian islands, you know, a month or two after it all happened because it's a very famous incident. And he writes this letter. Are these, are these people, you know, are they afraid to stand up? They've got to defend their rights. They're going to lose all their rights. They're going to lose all of their liberties if they don't do something and stand up immediately. And he will become like a leader of opposition to British policies in New Haven in the 1770s. But what he does in 1774, he actually will gain, I guess we call it a title or whatever, to be uh, a militia leader and will be given a, a, a charter to organize a militia company, the second company of foot guards in, in Connecticut. And he begins to organize a militia company because he smells something bad is coming. And boom, Arnold's in it immediately. So one of his first big actions is heading up to Fort Ticonderoga in New York, right? That's right. And I mean, that that's another thing, something else when you, to going back to what history taught us, a lot of times people don't realize it's not like the war started in 1776, right? We That's what we think about July 4th and all that. But he's headed up to Fort Ticonderoga, which is in northern New York. They knew that there was a lot of cannon there. It's a very impressive fort, but it's also not heavily guarded. And Arnold heads up there to take it over. Now, this is probably a, a great microcosm of Arnold in the entire revolution is he runs into – another revolutionary named Ethan Allen. And things kind of go badly. Give me give me a little bit about what happens when he meets Ethan Allen and what he knows as the Green Mountain Boys. Okay, very quickly, Arnold will march his second company of foot guards uh, from New Haven to the Boston area where the British, uh, this is after Lexington and Concord within a very few days, uh, in late April of 1775, the British are sort of trapped all these New Englanders pour out and surround Boston, and Arnold would join that group. And he knows some of the leaders in Massachusetts from his business dealings and that sort of thing. And that uh, he will say, are you all aware of, we got all this cannon and weaponry up in this fort, Ticonderoga, that is out west, go to the Hudson River, go north, go to the bottom of Lake Champlain, and there sits this fort, and there's all this weaponry you're going to need if you're going to really stand up to the British. After all, you have them trapped in Boston. It would help if you have weapons. If you're going to have a real army, you have to have artillery to really stand up to British power, which is militarily significant at the time. Arnold will go west, and boom, he runs into this guy, Ethan Allen, and the Green Mountain Boys. Now, just to be clear, Ethan Allen is not just a furniture store. This is a real American revolutionary. That's right. I call him the furniture dealer, but I don't know how Ethan Allen furniture emerged from Ethan Allen the person. But Ethan Allen, the person, was a big, tall guy, sort of threatening in appearance. And he has his friends, the Green Mountain Boys from the New Hampshire area, the Vermont Territory. They've gotten word, we should go get all these cannons and everything. And so they meet literally on May 9th, 1775. And between them and the fort is Lake Champlain. 
and they will meet. And Arnold says, I'm in charge. I have a commission. I'm a colonel in the Massachusetts militia. Ellen says, well, I ha- I'm operating on the authority, and I've been given a little bit of money uh, from the Connecticut government. Why don't you go away? They will argue over it. They supposedly then agree to a joint command. They will cross over. They'll easily conquer the fort because there's really no opposition there. There may have been a shot or two fired. There's no killing that goes on but they overrun the fort. And here's a key point. Arnold, to, this to him is a serious mission. I must work. I will go out. We're going to do an inventory of all those weapons there. And then there's a farther point, Crown Point North, that has a few weapons. And we're going to inventory them. And then we're going to begin to figure out how we can get them back east to support the army that's building the Patriot Force around Boston. Ethan Allen's guys are there. I hate to say this because I'm not never popular in Connecticut when I point these things out. They were there to plunder. In fact, the number one target is a rather substantial rum supply, and they will drink it down. It didn't take them that long. It's something like 90 or 100 gallons of rum. <laughs> so, Sounds like a party. Arnold's trying to make sense of this, and they're getting drunk, okay? And so ultimately, when there's so little plunder to take and the rum is all gone, the, the boys will sort of pull back into Vermont, leaving the assignment to Arnold, who will try to make something of it. This is really the beginning of a huge story of the Northern Campaign, which is right at the heart of Arnold's story and contributions to the revolution. But you're not going to get a lot of sympathy. Ethan Allen, I know he's really not our focus, but let me tell you quickly, he later uh, in the fall with a few guys, he'll try to take Montreal. They failed or captured. He's sent to England in chains. He'll come back and they don't know what to do with him. Whatever he does is sort of screwed up. And so in the end, he writes uh, a classic memoir, Allen's uh, narrative of the events, which is a lot of it's basically made up. And he sort of drifts off into history, but his name's Six. I, I tell you, this is where you and I always diverge on Ethan Allen, because he, he's very often depicted as just this kind of drunken idiot, which we won't even get into that <laughs> one. That's its own podcast. But what I will say is he plays Arnold perfectly from the politics game in this entire episode. He's the one that basically says, okay, we'll just do a joint command, knowing full well that he'll just screw Arnold on the back end. Because by most things that you read, Arnold shows up, he's kind of a bit pompous, he's that, you know, hoity-toity type of guy, and you've got Ethan Allen and his mountain men coming out of there, and that's what they were, and that's what they were okay with. And, you know, Ethan Allen's this backwoods guy, but he plays the politics game. He makes it seem like he was the only one who took Ticonderoga. He barely mentions Arnold, if at all. And that sticks significantly. A lot of times when you hear about Ticonderoga, you hear about Ethan Allen, and Arnold is almost never mentioned. I mean, this backwoods guy played Arnold perfectly in the politics game, and that's something that keeps coming up, isn't it? Yes. Very much so. And that's one of the things I go into in the book, because while I'm not a fan, obviously, of Ethan Allen, the guy was pretty shrewd in some areas. And he had his supporters there. Remember, Arnold's there at that point, even though he's been commissioned uh, to uh, put together a regiment through four or 500 guys. Uh, and there's some recruiting that's going on with a couple of individuals associated with Arnold. Arnold doesn't have the troops. Allen has all the troops. He has everything. Plus, he has uh, individuals who are bright and are literate, and they will compose a series of letters, one, one of which goes back to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, one of which is carried by one of the great louts of the revolution. I always say that because I'm saying this for certain people, a man by the name of John Brown, who is some sort of a hero in the Mohawk Valley, and I still can't figure out why. But Brown will carry a letter to the Continental Congress. It's, it's wonderful. And what it does is the Continental Congress has just begun to meet, the Second Congress. It starts on May 10th, the very day of this, of this uh, uh, attack on Fort Ticonderoga. But anyway, Brown shows up and they announce that he's going to come in and report this action in Ticonderoga. And, and so he says, I'm here to just congratulate us because... My good friend and stalwart great patriot, uh, Ethan Allen, and his associates, the Green Mountain Boys, and I'm involved with them. We took Fort Ticonderoga. And what is funny is, what is the reaction of the Congress? Most of the leaders in the Second Continental Congress did not want a war. They wanted reconciliation. They wanted to be a part of the British Empire. They wanted to settle their differences. And so the reaction to Brown is, you did what? Wait a minute, Brown, sorry, comes back. Well, you don't like this? 
oh, well, listen, I really was covering for the real thug here. You know, the really bad guy in all this was this guy, Benedict Arnold. He was the one who really wanted to take the place. And he just kind of stirred up and we were thinking, the Congress then votes literally to make sure that those weapons are left alone because we don't want the British to think that we're really going on the offensive in this war. So they're treated as a big mistake. <laughs> and so, but what's funny about that is Arnold gets blamed <laughs> in the minds of leaders in Congress. And what does that do to his reputation? Well, maybe he is this kind of uncontrollable guy. Maybe we got to keep our eye on this troublemaker, Benedict Arnold. And, and, and that's how that's how this, this amazing episode actually ends. So, yes, I give Ethan Allen credit up to a certain point. But then, remember, he's the one who said in his memoir, I, I took the four uh, based on uh, Great Jehovah and the, the Continental Congress. I took it in their name. And that's not what he said at all. He apparently said, come out, you old rats, or something like that. But that's sort of glamorizing the revolution from Mellon. So, you know, you got Tyre Conderoga, that, that goes relatively well, depending on how you're looking at it. And then his next big action is to try and take Quebec, which a lot of times that's ignored. But it seems like the United States, especially in these early days, even through the War of 1812, really wanted Canada, like just really wanted Canada. And quite frankly, it was always a bad idea. Um, but Arnold takes a, you know, a massive army up to try and take Quebec and doesn't really go all that well, does it? Let me try to frame it this way in a couple of different ways. First of all, most people, when they read a little bit about the Revolutionary War, presume all the, the, the important stuff happened around George Washington. That's not true, because there are several theaters during this war, one of, one of the most important at the outset, not so much the central area, not so much New England, that's the, where the war begins to spread and the war spreads. Primarily, it goes north into Canada. Why? There is a good military strategic reason for this, because the British, if they want to destroy this revolution, once they get into it and realize they've got a real problem, it's not just fighting a few people in Boston and scaring them. When you move beyond that, and they will try this, they're going to move a force from Boston up into Canada, back then locate it in New York City. 300 miles north is Montreal. You control that water corridor, and the effect is, if you can think of this, you separate all the colonies from New England. You then isolate New England, the center of the rebellion. Once you're in control of the Hudson River on up, you move a force sweep across New England. You bring in a naval force on the other side, you squeeze New England, the revolution's over. Now, Arnold, what is so incredible about this guy with no military experience, but having a sense of geography from his mercantile activity, understands this. Now, there are a few of the guys, a few other people did too. And so Arnold will actually write the Continental Congress, we need to bring Canada, that is Quebec province, north of us, north of New York, north of New England, in as the 14th colony in rebellion. We need to block the British from moving an army uh, which would be up the St. Lawrence River, down through that water corridor I just described, bring another army up, cut off New England. He understood, he writes it, and he said, we've got to go up there and we've got to take this. He's an advocate for this. In fact, he even said, yes, here's a guy who's at this point a colonel. Well, he's going to lose that too. I'll lead a force up there if you want. And the Congress people are saying, who is this guy? You know, isn't he the one that caused all the problems at Fort Ticonderoga? Uh, so they don't give him the assignment. But then enter George Washington. George Washington is named commander in chief in mid July of 1775. He gets up in the uh, to Cambridge outside of Boston in early July of 1775. In August, Arnold's been relieved of his command at Ticonderoga for reasons we they're so involved we don't want to get into them. Arnold will actually go and try to settle his accounts because he was spending a lot of his money. To support the force that he was involved with up in the New England area. And Arnold will meet with Washington. Washington says, this guy's great. He's got great ideas and he's full of enthusiasm. Washington will see that he's named a colonel. Arnold is in the Continental Army. And he will be then commissioned to lead a force into take Quebec. The key to controlling the province, the whole province, is to take the walled city of Quebec. And so Arnold then is going, it's an amazing story. They have forced up through the main wilderness, 
uh, into the kind of the wilderness of Canada below Quebec. And uh, this is the beginning of a major, major campaign. Arnold has a force of 1,200 that volunteer to go with him. They're going into uncharted territory. They think it's going to take two to three weeks to go what they think is 150 to 180 miles, what's twice as long as that. They launch about September 15th, September 20th of 1775. They don't make the breakthrough uh, to be on the other side of the St. Lawrence looking over Quebec until approximately November 10th, to November 12th. 60 days as opposed to three weeks will took them twice as more than twice as long to break through. One of the groups, four or 500 of them, defected. They didn't think they could break through. They got hit with all sorts of bad weather. Some of them are going to starve to death because they went out of food. It's one of the most colossally great adventure stories in all of American history that people don't really know anything about. But Arnold got the force before Quebec then in the middle of November of 1775, and that's just the beginning of this uh, amazing attempt that will ultimately, if we jump way ahead to the Saratoga campaigns in 1777, set the stage for American victory uh, in the war for independence. That's the part of the Arnold story that most people don't know about. The tradition with Arnold, going all the way back to the first biographies, Jared Sparks, who was a 19th century literary figure, president of Harvard briefly, wrote the first Arnold biography, incorporated all these stories about him. The overall point is, is that what has happened is most writers have sort of followed that pattern set by Sparks. And that's a very distorted view of reality. We don't live our lives backward. Arnold didn't know when he was born in 1741 that he was going to be in the kind of position he was in in 1780. You've got this whole life story that we've talked about portions of it that will set the stage ultimately for the treason. But what's invariably left out and what's very confusing because people want to think bad is this good period between 1775 and 1778 where I believe you can argue that his actions were critical to the overall American victory in the war for independence. Incredibly ironic for him because he ends up on the other side. With Quebec, too, you know, from what I've read, knowing military history and things like that, first of all, they're showing up at probably the worst time to be trying to take something in Canada. And not to mention, it sounds like Quebec is on a scale of one to ten 10 out of 10 in difficulty of taking. And the people of Canada at that point really didn't seem to want anything to do with the American Revolution. I mean, being honest, a whole bunch of Americans wanted nothing to do with the American Revolution, but Canada really just did not support it. And Quebec, fast forwarding, right? Because we said you could spend days talking about it, but fast forwarding, they get to Quebec, they have to start attacking faster than they want because enlistments are about to expire. Leadership, General Montgomery, who is talked about like he was a saint and just a wonderful leader is killed almost immediately and it becomes a debacle. Arnold basically had to be dragged from the field because he really is, I, I mean, he is psychopathic almost when it comes to battle. Like he wants to be in battle. He wants to keep fighting even when it seems ridiculous to keep fighting. When they don't take Quebec, a Saratoga to me is what everyone knows about. But the most impressive thing about Arnold that he did during the revolution was the Battle of Valcour Island, which absolutely, unless you're an American Revolution nut, you don't know about Valcour Island. So just to set that up, and I'll let you kind of talk about it. They leave Quebec. Arnold realizes that they're going to follow behind them. They have to do some sort of stalling activity. And as they're coming down past Lake Champlain and things like that, there's the Battle of Valcour Island. What happens there? To give you just a, a bit of background, the British actually Marshall, Marshall put together a huge force that they send into Canada, and it will begin to arrive in early May of 1776. Arnold has already been pulled back for various reasons to Montreal, and he will be one of the leaders in the retreat as that British force sweeps and several thousand sweep on up to from Quebec to Montreal, uh, and then will proceed to enter and go as far as Lake Champlain before the campaign is is over in 1776 when winter will end it. Arnold is part of the pullback team. And one of the skills that he has, remember, this is a man with fundamentally no military experience uh, who has had some very interesting success. And he's had some failure because he's caught as one of the leaders in the failed attempt to take, take Quebec. 
Arnold will be given the assignment by General Philip Schuyler to become the commander of the rebel fleet on Lake Champlain. Now think about this, no military experience. And his background is what? As a merchant seaman. And so he becomes the commodore of this Lake Champlain fleet that will consist of 15, 16 vessels of different kinds. And he will help organize that fleet. And they will then proceed north and just wait for the British to come down because they know the British force of several thousand is going to come and actually you're going up Lake Champlain because the water flows to the north because it flows into Richelieu River and the St. Lawrence River. But the point is the target is to take Ticonderoga, get that back from the British and then use that as the launching pad in 1777 to finally close the gap, cut off New England. We've already talked about that in terms of strategy. Arnold now is in charge of the fleet. The British outman them, outgun them. They're superior in every way. Arnold's, he's, he's converted troops into sailors. They don't know even, many of them how to even point a cannon, let alone fire it. I mean, it's this incredibly raw crew. And he locates them in this very, very shrewd from a tactical point of view. Uh, in behind this island called Valcor Island, almost contiguous to the New York coastline on the, uh, what is the west side of Lake Champlain. And they sort of hide in there. And the British fleet on October 11th is going to sail around, discover them. They're going to have a day-long battle. And that day-long battle is the Battle of Valcor Island. And Arnold battles them to a draw. Why? Because the British have to sail their vessels against the wind. The wind is coming down from the north. You've got to sail north. A lot of these craft do not move easily into wind, and Arnold is able to fight to a draw. But his problem is, when the wind shifts, he's trapped. So he has to get out. Well, that evening, under cover of darkness and some fog, they'll line the fest of the American vessels that have survived, most of them had up, and they'll sneak around the British line, and now there's a race up the lake all the way to Ticonderoga, but it never gets to Ticonderoga because the British, the wind will favor them in all of this. And ultimately they'll start to run down Arnold, which is, is defending those other vessels trying to escape all the way down to Ticonderoga, the area of split rock on the uh, Lake Champlain. And Arnold will turn around to help the other vessels escape and he takes on five British vessels. And I'm not sure whether I should say five, it's four or six. <laughs> He takes on a lot of the British fleet. One guy, two and a half hours, the British blow his vessel, the Smithereens, and he keeps fighting. This is a guy refused to die. And somehow with his skills, and, and, and the British are amazed by this, and they, with his skills, he manages to, to get around or get out of that circle that's around him. And he goes into what today is actually called Arnold Bay on Lake Champlain. And they scuttled their vessel and a couple of other that were following Arnold at that time, and they escaped. That action, I would say, the split rock action, is probably the most dramatic two hours of fighting in the whole Revolutionary War. And who's in the middle of it? Arnold, as you said, this is a man who has no fear in combat. Now, whether that's because he's a psycho or whether it's because he's, you know, an Audie Murphy, you know, in the sense that for like most people going to combat, they're scared to death. And then many don't want to be there and will flee if they are there. But Arnold takes it on. It's like he's taken on that arbitrary power again, which I'll go back to that as one of the dominant themes, just as ultimately he's going to get around to trying to take on the arbitrary power in his mind, which is the American cause itself. That's why we use in the, in the documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. We don't put a question mark there. We ask the viewer to take the evidence, just as maybe I did years and years ago and said, well, let's go back into the archives and find what the real story is, not what people have repeated, as many, unfortunately, our biographers maybe have done. Let's get in there and let's really see what it's all about. And then you decide. And that's the question. Did he betray the revolution or did the revolution before he betrayed it, did the revolution betray him? And that's the kind of theme that we try to work out. We're not, we don't try to provide the answer, but we sure try to provide the question and get people to think about the material. And uh, from my point of view, that's why one of the things I was concluding in my book so long ago, 20 years ago, uh, and that's why this film is oriented toward that direction. And then you've got Martin Sheen as a narrator and all sorts of other good features and uh, some very interesting 
development from a filming point of view, trying to go to the real sites as much as uh, we could and so on and so forth to make it a truly realistic experience. So, I mean, to put Valcor Island in context, I'd like to use two baseball analogies. The fact that Arnold knows how to fight on land, which he's proven, and then can all of a sudden fight on the water. It, it's it's a lot like a baseball player being both hitter and a pitcher. Anyone who watches baseball, Shoshi Otani, who, you know, he's amazing. He can do both and it's just unheard of. Then on top of that, the second baseball analogy is Arnold was basically taking a little league team to play the Yankees and it ended in a tie. That's how ridiculous Valcor Island was. That's very good. I haven't thought about that, but that's right. And amazingly enough, as it works out, the land side and the naval side don't want to have anything to do with them. Because if you go to the chapel at West Point today and you go in there, there are all these plaques all over the place to the revolutionary generals. But there's one plaque that doesn't have a name on it and it doesn't have a rank on it. And that's the Benedict Arnold plaque. So they don't want him at West Point. It's been years since I've been to the Naval Academy, but I don't recall a lot of Credit to Arnold for winning, or actually nice, didn't win, but at least delaying the British in 1776 as the Commodore of Lake Champlain. I'm going to go this entire podcast without talking smack about the Navy, so we'll, we'll just skip that. <laughs> We're both bad. We're both, we both can be bad about that, right? <laughs> right. But Valcor Island, too, that was a draw tactically, but from the strategic perspective, the British are blocked. They spent so much time dealing with Arnold and took enough hits that they've got to turn around and go back. They can't continue down the Hudson like they were expecting, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Absolutely. They were blocked. They pulled back into Canada. Winter was coming on. These forces really can't fight and deal with supply lines and whatever else in the winter. They have to deal with all these logistical issues that can affect the flow, ebb and flow of combat. So it, this becomes the great delay of 1776, blocking the British. Even though you didn't win, you won. Kind of an ironic statement you did because you, you delayed them. When they finally come back in 1777, well, that's the happy ending for the Americans because John Burgoyne's army will be captured, will be defeated. Arnold's central to that uh, defeat. Uh, although he's seriously wounded for a second time, he'd already been wounded in Quebec uh, last day of 1775. This is a part of the story, but then just to put a little bow on it here, from this point of view, you think of Valcour in 76 with uh, Split Rock. 1777, you think of the Saratoga campaign, and then you think of the consequences. The consequences of Saratoga, the two major ones, number one, even though the British have been supporting them under the table, they see the Americans have a shot to win so let's get in on the kill and the British, and they generally, the French hate the British in this time, historically, at least. The second thing is the Brits have to change their strategy, and their strategy becomes to roll south and try to win back the southern colonies, and if everything would go well, to sweep north, and that's going to prove a failure, sort of symbolized by the loss of the uh, British Army at Yorktown in 1781. Well, you have Montreal, which, you know, he fought like a hero there. You have Valcour Island, where he did some amazing things. So, of course, as soon as these two things are done, everyone hails him as a hero, right? Like, everybody loves Benedict Arnold now, right? That is the most amazing thing. Arnold is up sailing around in Lake Champlain. He gets a letter from a friend of his in the Congress, the Continental Congress, because his antis including this guy, John Brown, although he wasn't present, had written up a lot of charges against Arnold that he was a thief and he was this and that, all the sorts of stuff, uh, a bunch of made up garbage in many ways. Then Horatio Gates, we haven't talked about him. He will carry that because he started to become jealous of Arnold because he's worked with Arnold. The whole point is that the word comes down to Arnold that your best friends aren't your countrymen. I and mean, that's what he's written while he's on Lake Champlain. Well, I mean, I think it's time, right? So Valcor Island, he's still not getting the credit he deserves. He's given up a lot just to get to this point. That's right. And now we're going to fast forward a little bit. There's some more events, but let's get right to Saratoga. Now, I know this is a sensitive subject for you because I am fully aware personally that Horatio Gates is one of your most loathed people, especially of the revolution, if not in history. Am I laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I want to hear this. So Arnold gets to Saratoga, and well, we're taught in history class, right? Battle of Saratoga, Horatio Gates wins that bad boy, takes a huge British army, and we're on our way to winning the American Revolution. But first of all, Saratoga isn't even one battle, right? 
it's it's two battles near Saratoga, not necessarily even necessarily right. in Saratoga. Right. Um, and when you look back and you really dig into it, the complete hero in this story is Benedict Arnold, but Gates gets all the credit. So now, do you want to go on a diatribe about how much you want Horatio Gates, or do you want to kind of set up Saratoga first? Well, um, I can set up Saratoga. And bash Gates at the same time? No, 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 I'm not going to bash Gates. Gates, uh, I sometimes think of Gates as a sad figure, rather. I don't want to say pathetic so much as sad figure. He is so full of the ambition, and then you get into his background, and because he's a retired British officer, he wasn't treated with great respect. He was a commoner, uh, and he'd been around too many of the lords and ladies, and it was very sensitive in these kinds of issues. And he wanted to get back into the war, but he wanted to be a commander. Washington said, this is a good staff guy. He can help me organize things. Whatever. But Gates wanted to be the leader and wanted to be the hero and be the glory guy. To cut through it all, Gates then ultimately in 1777, as the British come crashing down out of Canada, the army under Burgoyne, Congress, in what was one of its, and Congress made many a stupid move. I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. And they decided that we'll replace the general in charge, Philip Schuyler. Bottom didn't like him for personal reasons, and they made Gates the commander. Gates goes north, I'm in charge, and he's there, he's going to meet Arnold. There's now on to that Gates has perhaps not been supportive of him. Uh, the Gates says developed some jealousy toward him for various reasons. Arnold was out west helping to liber liberate Fort Stanwix from a diversionary force under Barry St. Ledger and uh, Chief Joseph Brandt of the Mohawk Indians. And he had cut off that diversionary force. He comes back up the Mohawk River. He meets Gates. And it's not a friendly occasion. But Gates then recognizes he has to make Arnold second in command. So Gates is the overall commander. Arnold is second in command. Arnold will be involved. We'll make a decision. Uh, if you think of the Hudson River, just going north and south. And then you to the west side, just think of an area called Bemis Heights, height of land. And the decision is made to locate the force there. That is the uh, Patriot force. Gates is the overall commander, Arnold is second in command, but Gates' thinking is that we'll just let the British attack us and they won't break our lines. Arnold says, well, if they come with enough force, they can break our lines and drive us right back, swing us into the Hudson River and we'll break and run, you know, then, then the British can just keep going south uh, in this process of trying to cut off New England. Well, what happens is the British begin to move. The 19th of September will be the first battle of Saratoga, uh, sometimes called Freeman's Farm. And Gates says, we'll just stay here. And Arnold begs and begs and begs and said, well, let's at least go out. Let's go challenge him a little bit and see if we can. And so that battle is going to begin and it's going to develop during the day. And Arnold finally gets permission to get out in the field. And he'll go back and say, send more troops, send more troops. We've got them. We can beat these folks. But Gates hesitates. And as a net result, in this case, Burgoyne is able to bring up reserves, more Hessians primarily. Uh, the battle by the end of the day will be a draw. Arnold, Arnold has been removed from the field by Gates, and that just leads to all sorts of turmoil right there between the two of them. The point that I want to make is, and this is true of the second battle, Gates was never near the fighting. Arnold was the commander in the field. Arnold has more or less been told to stay at headquarters uh, Gates said, well, if you can leave and go away if you want to, uh, but I'm not going to give you any command. Well, the British come out again. They got to break through. They either got to break through or go back to Canada. This is October 7th, a second battle of Saratoga, second Freeman's Farm, uh, depending on what you want to call it. Arnold is sulking aside. Now, I know there's a different story, but I don't believe that one, so I'm not going to tell that. And that's, that's the pro-Gates crowd from my point of view. But Arnold and Gates reconciled and Gates, uh, you know, Gates let Arnold go out in the field. Arnold went out in the field by himself and rallied the troops, drive the British back into their lines, which they had established after the 7th, September 19th battle. And Arnold, amazingly enough, at one point, rides between the two forces shooting at each other to get to another key point, which was on the right side of the British line. And Arnold will charge in there, drive forces in there, and that action breaks the British line because you start to fold up the British line moving from now its right side uh, into its left side. And the British will then begin a long retreat 
and ultimately a surrender. As for Arnold, he charges in. He is shot the second time, and as, as I remember, in his left leg, it's all mauled up. The horse comes crashing down on him. The horse dies on top of him, and he's stuck under the horse. And others will come up, and Arnold will supposedly say in a line that I'm not sure he ever said, you know, I wish the ball had gone through my heart instead of my leg, because I don't think that was his real sentiment. But he is now very, very seriously wounded. He will be a walking cripple the rest of his life because of these wounds. And on top of that, too, just a real quick aside for that one, the soldier who shot him is about to be killed by the American troops, and he tells them to spare him. Let the guy go. He's doing his job. He's supposed to. That's the more you're supposed to kill the other guy. That's what's going on. It's rather than, but that's part of gentlemanly warfare as part of the, the, the theme. But the bottom line is that Arnold is very seriously wounded. He's hauled off then to the south. Uh, 30, 40 miles south to a military hospital in the Albany area. And he will be recovering for several months, although he threatens to shoot a couple of guys if you cut off my leg, because they say we got to save your life when gangrene sets in. Well, somehow that leg and he survives all of this. I believe this is the beginning of the end of Arnold, even though he is the real hero of the fighting. The Continental Congress will mint a medal, and it's two gates. They declare him the hero of Saratoga, even Gates was not near the battles. But he is the overall commander. Arnold will be given credit, thank you kind of thing, and he will get his rank. There's been a big fight over that that we we can't go into. It's just too involved. But Congress will tell Washington to restore his seniority as a major general. All sorts of things are going on. Washington writes Arnold. Congress doesn't even have the guts to write Arnold and say, we screwed up and we didn't promote you way back when. It's been a big fight about that. And what will actually happen then is Arnold, Washington sends him epilepsy to honor him, shoulder epilepsy, and Arnold doesn't respond. But when he finally does after a few weeks, the letter he writes to Washington is so very important, I believe, because he doesn't say, I'm ready to stand up and fight for my cause again. Rather, he wishes Washington that I wish you all success with your cause and with your country. He is literally mentally beginning to divide himself from that country because he's not calling it our cause, our country, it's your cause and your country. And then it's a whole series of things. Another huge story, becoming military governor of Philadelphia, marrying Peggy Ship, and it just goes on and on from there. But for Arnold, it's pretty much all downhill in terms of supporting the American cause. And it's becoming military governor of Philadelphia. He wants to get back in the fight. They said, your leg's too bad. You can't back in the fight. We'll make you military governor of Philadelphia, which, looking back, is probably literally the worst job you could have handed Benedict Arnold. Because number one, he's an action guy. He is not a rear guard type of guy, necessarily. Philadelphia is just recently taken back by the Americans, which means there's still plenty of loyalists. And then Philadelphia is just all politics at this point. It was the worst situation for him to possibly be in. And it very much seems, as you're talking about, right, he starts to kind of turn against the revolution. And he also seems to really start worrying about money at this point. Uh, It seems to come up more. Would that be accurate to say that all of a sudden the money is starting to preoccupy him? So yes, the money aspect, I think, overemphasized because the traditional explanation of Arnold, Philadelphia forward, he's consumed by money. He marries this Eve-like woman named Peggy Shippen. Then, of course, the devil's hanging around because his double imagery runs through all of this kind of traditional literature about Arnold anyway. So put Peggy and money and the devil together and you have Benedict Arnold. And that's what, as you do, as you look backward through treason. But Arnold had already given a lot of his fortune to the cause in a variety of ways, both in monetary terms and in other ways. He had given his health. He writes about how I fought and bled and I'm not appreciated. That kind of stuff is really working in his mind. And when he is then attacked by these Philadelphia leaders like Joseph Reed, who's the president, and there's a title, the president of, uh, they don't really have a governor of uh, Pennsylvania and that sort of thing, and they're attacking him and his character. That's the most bothersome issue from his point of view. Arnold does still have some means. Congress owes him money. Congress is not going to pay him that money because they don't have the money to pay much of anybody anything. And Arnold will do the things that are so characteristic. He calls out Congress 
saying, why aren't you supporting the widows? Arnold embarrasses Congress because he puts forward money to support this woman who was the concert or widow or common law wife would be the way to put it, of Joseph Warren and the children because they were living in very dilapidated poor conditions in Boston. He's trying to support a person who had actually helped him get that Colonel's Commission back in 1775. Warren is a very important subject in and of himself in terms of the revolution. It's the classic kind of up yours from Benedict Arnold to the Congress. And so these are the kinds of things that are really in play. If I can put it this way, it's a pattern of Arnold starting to have suspicions in 1776 when he didn't think the army was being well supported in Canada and in its retreat, which may have been a little bit unfair. But then it's growing kind of disillusionment, your best friends aren't your countrymen kind of stuff, uh, increasing disillusionment, the war wounds come into play. It's a much more complex but understandable picture, I believe. And that in the end, money may have been an issue. Peggy may have been an issue. Well, I'll let people decide for themselves in terms of the devil. What I can tell you is it's a complex, it's really a story of moving from disillusionment to ultimately being embittered to the point to say, what did we do to ourselves? All we did is we're creating another monster. In trying to get rid of this monster, we've created another monster. It's not going to be any better. It's going to be a bunch of Joseph Reeds and John Browns, and it's going to not be worth its own salt. Now, I don't agree with that, but that was the way he looked at it. And that's part of also what we're trying to convey and communicate uh, in terms of understanding him. And as we know, Benedict Arnold wasn't alone. There are a lot of people that had real doubts about the revolution. Uh, 25, 30% of the population, we call them loyalists, and uh, they made you know different kinds of decisions at various times. And there are a lot of people going back and forth, and we don't really recognize that. A lot of that in terms of the general population would be the British armies in my cornfield, I'm a British supporter. The American armies in my cornfield, I'm an American supporter. There are, there's a lot of this population that is not committed much one way or the other. It's really the let who would be king kind of mentality. I'm going to be a subject either way. Speaking of which, Peggy Ship and his second wife, that's a very loyalist family. And there is, to this day, a lot of scholarly arguments. In your research, what is your opinion? How important is Peggy in him turning full on traitor? Was she just an avenue for him because she had the contacts? Or do you think she was part of changing his mind to go full traitor? I think Arnold's mind was made up before he married Peggy, if I can put it that way. But Peggy did have contacts. She was not as often portrayed some sort of concert of uh, John Andre. That's basically, Andre was interested in another shipping woman that we do know. What I can tell you is that in my mind, she did know people who were on the other side, that is on the British side. And she may have said it, Arnold, but I think Arnold went to her and said, I'm so disillusioned by all this stuff, I don't know what to do. And she's a teenager. You know, she's trying to console her husband who's, here he is, mangled leg, you know, his health is, is very marginal. Uh, he's, he's, he's been beat up in so many different ways. He's a determined fighter. She's saying, well, I know this guy over here. That makes her complicit. But you know, does the person, you know, you go in and rob a bank, does the person who drive the car, how complicit are they compared to the person that robs the bank? That's the kind of thing you get into in this kind of a situation. And there are a couple of fairly recent Peggy biographies referring to Peggy Shippen, and they try to absolve her, but then they blame Arnold that she was, I would say, bedazzled or something like that, uh, you know, and that she really didn't like Arnold in the end anyway. That's not true. That is just totally out of context. In the end, she wrote letters when he passed to her children, because the family is now scattered to the wind. They're living in London. There's children in various locations. And she writes the family and says, I've lost this. Basically, she doesn't use the word wonderful, but this very good man in my life. Uh, and I just want you to be aware of this. Uh, and I'm going to do everything I can to settle, because in the end, he is financially uh, in bad shape for a variety of reasons to go well beyond our story. 
So ultimately, he ends up in contact with Major John Andre, British intelligence officer, and they start talking numbers and things like that. And ultimately, the idea is to get Arnold put in charge of West Point on the Hudson River. We'd mentioned it a couple of times before. He's able to go up there. And basically, the plan is to just make West Point as weak as possible while being in charge of it so that the British can easily take it. Because as you mentioned early on, if you can take the Hudson, you've cut the colonies in half. And the war is as good as done. And then ultimately, Andre has to physically meet with Arnold and he gets caught. And in an amazing dichotomy, which I just love because only history can do this. Andre is caught behind enemy lines. Ultimately, he's put as a spy. He's going to have to be executed. Benedict gets away. And what I find really interesting is around the same time, you have very important American patriots, founding fathers, whoever meets Andre is like, hey, George, please don't have him executed. Please, George Washington, don't execute this guy. These same people are like, Benedict Arnold needs to die. Besides winning the war, I think if you ask George Washington, what are the things that you want to accomplish at that point? It's win the war and kill Benedict Arnold from that point. Is that correct? If I could put it this way, there are many ironies about Arnold. He ends up on the wrong side, but then he is used by Washington's a very good propagandist. And he's, I mean, he's shattered. He loved Arnold. I mean, I, I don't want to overstate that. He said he's my, my best fighting general and terribly shattered that this man would turn against him, doesn't understand it. And he says, we're going to turn everything on Arnold. We're going to turn him into the devil, incarnate himself, the kind of person who would destroy all the good that we're trying to bring to this country. And so Arnold then becomes a whipping post to stir up what was very much a time of lagging support for the Revolutionary War in 1780 and into 1781. The cause, it's it's more than stifled, this is moribund for all practical purposes. And Washington and others use Arnold to sort of generate new enthusiasm in the cause. You too, you know, could be a Benedict Arnold if you don't get behind this cause. You too could be committing problems. They'll have parades and they'll do all sorts of things to stir up the people and to try to get them for that one final punch so that we can finally outlast the British and win the war and get on with our creation of a new American republic. And Washington is his perfect mirror image, right? Because Washington was under a lot of the same stresses. Uh, You know, Gates is trying to take over the war and things like that. Continental Congress is depending on the day, is either fully behind him or they're ready to replace him. Everything he owns would be taken. I mean, he would be the number one. If they lose, he's ruined from day one. And you have Arnold, right, who is facing a lot of those same things, not nearly as starkly necessarily. And yet Washington never truly goes into the type of despair that Arnold does. And also, it's very interesting to me, which is something that we've talked about before, is that if you were a George Washington acolyte, Benedict Arnold is the only one that ever turned traitor of those people. Well, of his immediate circle. Right. That's right. But one of the things that was different about Arnold was that Arnold really never was with Washington, just just occasionally, because Washington trusted Arnold so much as a commander who was capable of independent command that I could send him out and he'd do everything he could short of life itself, maybe even give his life to succeed. And he didn't have a lot of folks like that. And so he wasn't part of of the Washington inner, inner circle, not like the Hamilton Lafayette. If Arnold had really been more under Washington, some of these things have happened. My guess is some of it wouldn't have happened because people maybe like messing with Arnold, but they would not mess with Washington. Washington was his own guy and you didn't mess with him. In many ways, Arnold's life is a study in tragedy because the guy was so talented. And name someone else from a Revolutionary War, from a, another recent war, who was winning on land and winning on sea in and of itself. That's that's incredible. And yet, what do we know about him? Not that he won on land, he won on sea. What do we know was he was the ultimate traitor. So if you go to the great obelisk, the great monument at the Saratoga Surrender Site, which is about eight miles, nine miles north of the battlefields, you look there at the monument celebrating the Amer- great American victory at Saratoga. Many, including me, believe was a key turning point of the Revolutionary War. And it's four-sided. On one side, you have Horatio Gates, the hero of Philadelphia. On another side, you have Daniel Morgan, who had come up with his riflemen and participated in the battle. They were very critical from that point of view. By the way, worked very well with Arnold. On the third side, you have Philip Schuyler, who had been the commander, got replaced, who kept working to keep supplying the American force. And then on the fourth side, 
in this area where you have the other three that is the are drawn there 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 are statues of them in the fourth area there's nothing that is benedict arnold's place and that's in many ways the story of benedict arnold in terms of the america ultimately he doesn't deserve a place even though he was so critical to winning the war another kind of irony upon irony upon irony about this particular story. And that's what we try to capture in that film. I will say that monument is deliciously spiteful, but I still like the boot monument better. The boot monument's great. It's just a monument with just one boot on it. It says something to the effect of... It's the wounded leg. That's what it is. It's the wounded leg. And it says to the something like to the great fighting general or something, or something along that line of the American Revolution, but there's no name. Because I believe, I forget who it was, somebody asked... Uh, Arnold asked somebody, what would you do if you caught me? And they said, we'd cut off your left leg and give it a hero's burial. And the rest of you, Lord knows. That's right. That's one of those stories that's out there. Whether it was said or not, it's still, it's there. And that's in many ways how we look at it. And ultimately, Benedict Arnold, in his life, from an American perspective, got what he deserved. Because afterwards, you know, the British used him, but it seemed to be very clear they didn't like him. No, Nobody likes a traitor on either side. Uh, he lives in England. He lives in Canada. He bounces around and he once again just cannot seem to get along with anyone for any length of time. Things are still following him around and he has just a very sad life from then on out. Meanwhile, you have all of these other heroes that stuck by Washington in the revolution and he is just left completely out in the cold without a friend in the world. Right. The only one of so many of those key guys around Washington broadly defined, it didn't go anywhere, was Horatio Gates. Washington didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, again, that's another story. How did you get Martin Sheen on the documentary? Is he a huge history nerd and we didn't know it, or somebody just cut a real big check? That's a deal that I did not directly participate in, but I approved of very much. Because what you want to do is you don't want to have Jim Martin narrating, because I don't have a name like that, Martin Sheen, or a, a, a you know, big Hollywood star. But he liked the material. That, that is what I'm told, the, the folks who made that particular deal. And that he was willing to give some of his time because he said, this is, this is an amazing, it's what it is. It's an amazing story. That's one reason we keep going back to it. It's one of the most fascinating stories of the American Revolution. And the American Revolution, in turn, is one of the most fascinating stories of uh, all of American history. And so I think that had a lot to do with it. And I give him great credit for that. He did a wonderful job. Yeah, I think it was great beginning to end. There's just a lot of information. And even if you're not a huge history nerd, there's plenty to learn in there that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you really dig into this stuff. Well, Jim, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That was great. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much, Jim, for coming on once again. We're going to bring him back more times. Like, it's just definitely going to happen. Hope you enjoyed it. Listen, everybody, please like follow, rate us, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, History Nerds United, go on out there and follow everything that we're doing. We're going to be doing more things for you, putting out more content. We hope you like all of it. And listen, get on there and let us know what you think. Give us comments. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you want less of, what you want more of. We're up for it. We want to hear it. Thanks for listening, nerds. Talk to you soon.